Hey, Barry. Hey, Al. Who should you call if you get locked out of your house? Who? A monk. They always have the key. It's time for Compelled Duel. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Compelled Duel. I'm Al. And I'm Barry. And we are a single-player, co-DM'd D&D 5e actual play podcast. Previously on Compelled Duel. You see a line of Australian ships. You would never make it through if you didn't have this plan to ride on. Names, origins, and reasons for visiting. And the Pirate King of the Zephyr Royals. And we were hoping to, uh, shouldn't have said I was a pirate. Sabine turns around from the railing and oh so sweetly to the captain says, Dear, shut the fuck up. Things are not going well in Gimtarum, it seems. Okay, yeah, this has got to fucking stop. This is worse than we thought it was. Ravane, what happened with Zed? You're asking the wrong person. I've been trying to keep in touch with him. He hasn't gotten back to me in months. That doesn't sound like him. Maybe not to you. A bar fight! Mr. Stonebloom, you and I really have to stop meeting like this. He's gonna try and kiss you. The world's fucking going to shit and I'm the one that has to fix it and I thought you didn't want me! His pupils are just blown. Zed is fucked up right now. Leo is on a razor's edge psychologically right now, but it's his turn to be the strong one. He's just gonna keep it together as best he can. What, you don't want me? Zed, if you are fucked up enough right now to be throwing my own words back in my face, number one, you don't need to be pursuing this course of action, and number two, I'll play that game with you. You don't want to do something stupid right now. Go to bed. I'd like to cast silence on the bedroom. (laughs) And he just cries until he is unconscious. So, Leo. After all of the fucked up shit that happened last night, you wake up in Zed's room. He is still snoring on the bed. You are on the floor, using his duffel bag as a pillow. What are you doing? Feeling like an absolute pile of shit, mostly. But after a while of laying on the floor, staring at the ceiling, he's going to realize how much his back hurts and then get up and check on Zed. This man is out like a fucking light, just fully passed out, hugging a pillow. Leo leans down and goes like he's going to pet his hair back and then clenches his fist and pulls away. And he's going to head back out the door, try to find where the kitchen is to maybe get him some water, I think. The kitchen is not hard to find. Somebody's brewing coffee. You hear the sounds of somebody, like, rustling around in there. You would assume it's the roommate that Zed mentioned. Well, this is about to be awkward. Yeah, it is. You going in? Yeah, if he had more presence of mind about the situation, Leo would maybe, like, knock or introduce himself. But he's just going to go. It's not big. It's a lot like the kitchen in Ravane and Verity and Aravay and Celica and Talindra's apartment. It's very cramped, very, like, galley-style almost. And there's someone standing in there with their back to you. Just under five feet tall, hair tied back in a very practical braid, wearing armor over a really nice but simple canary yellow tunic and some very sturdy boots. You see this person's ears twitch as you come in, 
and there are these big, frilled, almost goblinoid ears, mottled gray, green, and brown. This person is just making themselves coffee at the counter. Yeah, Leo's barely conscious and has no social graces right now. He's just going to lean in the doorframe and nod over at the coffee pot and go, Hey, you uh, mind if I steal a cup of that? As this person turns around, there is a smashing sound as she accidentally completely chucks her full mug of coffee onto the floor and yells, What the fuck? Time slows to a crawl for you as she starts to turn her head and you see the distinct angular profile of one Princess Eleonora Ashthorn. What do you want me to roll for Leo to not pass out? I am dead serious. Roll me a whiz save. That was a 19. Regrettably, you remain conscious. Leo doesn't pass out, but he does fully stagger out of the doorframe and catch himself on the counter before he hits the floor. Uh, uh, Eleonora? What the fuck are you doing here? What the fuck are you doing here? This is my kitchen, and you're dead! What? Okay, I am starting to put some things together. We're entering a situation where Zed has just forgotten to tell a lot of people that I'm alive, right? Zed, Zed, Zed's been high for the last, like, eight months, all right? He told me a lot of things. Yes, he told me you were alive. He also told me he thought there was a dragon rampaging through the city. So, grain of fucking salt on things that Zed says. It, it's a really long story. Got pulled into a malfunctioning teleportation portal. Got zapped to Oskaya. Almost died a couple times. Getting along with my sister now. We're here to stop the incoming war, and you are supposed to be in Tordun. What the hell is going on here? <laughs> Eleanor reaches up and, like, fists one hand in her hair and says, Well, uh, my father died, and I heard that you died, and I had a little bit of a nervous breakdown, so I thought, hey, I'll go check in on my good friend Zed. We'll see how that works. And then I had to pick him up out of a gutter, and now I'm here. I... Oh, God, Eleonora, I'm so sorry. There is a pause. You watch her shoulders soften a little bit. And then from behind you, you hear, What in the fuck is going on? Leo brings one shaking hand up to pinch the bridge of his nose. Be quiet, he said. My roommate is sleeping, he said. Thanks for the heads up, Zed. There's a beat of silence, and then Zed says, When the fuck did you- And he brings both hands up to just kind of hover around his head. I, I don't- I don't understand what the fuck's going on here. Before you have time to process that, Eleonora shoots back, You don't get to yell! I am the person that started yelling! I am the only person that's allowed to yell right now! Everybody shut up! Leo shuts up, but he looks over at Zed kind of confused. There is a long, silent moment. Eleonora smooths down her hair, nods to herself, and says, I'm making coffee. Does anyone want coffee? We need coffee for this conversation. I would bury a knife in someone's chest for some coffee right now, Eleonora. Thank you so much. Zed, from the doorway of the kitchen, still looking extremely confused, says, Yeah. Same, same here, one for me. And then he just puts his hands down and then puts them back up and just turns and goes into the living room. Eleonora makes you all coffee and then goes into the living room herself. I assume you follow. Yes, very confused and very tired. I do. Eleonora does not even bother to try and sweep up the mug that she threw across the room. Just leaves that there for later. Zed is sitting down on their couch with his head in his hands. And Eleonora puts a mug down in front of him a little more forcefully than uh, you think she maybe intends to. And says, right, let's, let's all talk about this like adults. Let's, let's go over what happened, because I was asleep last night, and this was not the situation. And then I woke up, and now this is the situation. <laughs> 
Zed, do you want to tell her about the situation, or should I? Zed, still with his head in his hands, does not look up, just says, You remember, uh... When I told you how, when I was with my ex, I got into all that trouble because I was having blackouts. So you don't remember anything from last night, then? It'll, it'll come back to me eventually. I, and then he stops and he looks up, horrified. Oh, fuck, what did I do? We'll get into that after I cover the big picture for both of you, I suppose. Leo looks a little more pissy than he means to. Speaking of the big picture, for that I'm going to make a long story very, very short, and then Zed, when we get to your portion of the explanation, I'm going to make a relatively short story kind of long, so just bear with me here. I'm running on not a great trance and several, several months of unceasing trauma. As I was just telling Eleonora, when... Fee and I went into the portal, something happened, it malfunctioned, we didn't die, in fact, even though that was what the rest of the world was told. We got zapped all the way to the middle of nowhere in Oskaya, spent several months on that hell continent, which did a real number on me, as you both can see, and he waves at his whole thing, the scar and the haircut and the loss of a bunch of his muscle mass, walked across a bunch of the country, Definitely made me sure that I don't ever want to go camping again. Did you know that moths in Oskaya have like a five-foot wingspan? Anyway, we got out of the country on a ship, landed in Candlelight Wharf, and immediately got kidnapped by pirates, one of whom my sister is now dating. We convinced said pirates, with a fair bit of help from my sister's feminine wiles, I am sure, to help get us back here so we can shut down the blockade and hopefully stop all-out war from happening, given that my father is pursuing it under the pretense that Fee and I died on Valduran soil. Which didn't happen. Well, Fee died, but it was in the Zephyr Isles and I fixed it, it's fine. Anyway, we are back. We are hoping to get to Valdur and gather the rest of our party and then figure out what the fuck we are doing next. Does anybody have any questions on the big picture? There is a long pause. Eleonora puts a finger up, opens her mouth, closes it, takes a big sip of her coffee, opens her mouth again, and then says, No, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm great. I'm totally cool with what's going on right now. All right, and now for the more detailed portion of our little recap. So, we landed in Gimtarum yesterday. Oh my god, yesterday. <laughs> I feel like I've been here for a hundred years. In unison, Eleonora and Zed say, same. Anyway, there was a whole thing with the Pirate Queen of Australia and the Navy. I'll catch you up on all of that later once we are able to sit down and have an actual war council with everyone. But we got past the blockade, got into the city, went and saw Ravain. He yelled at me for a long time. And then we went to a bar where I saw a very familiar face getting into a fight with, mm, three dudes. Zed has his head in his hands again. You watch just the structural integrity of his posture starts degrading. He just slumps forward. I was able to shut down the fight, I got you outside, we had a reunion, I had a panic attack, and then realized that you were- realized what was going on, and got you home. You- <sighs> we'll talk about it later. I slept on your floor last night, and then I got up to get you some water this morning, and Eleonora was in your kitchen. So that's what you missed. Here we are. What happens next, everybody? There's a pause. Yeah, no shit, Sherlock. Eleonora says, Again, it's my kitchen, and doesn't matter. War Council, that sounds great! I didn't know Ravane was still in the city. Leo takes a very slow sip of his coffee and cuts his eyes sideways over at Zed. You didn't tell her that Ravane was still in the city? Eleonora also looks over at Zed. You knew Ravane was still in the city? 
And Zed gives up on sitting up. He just slumps forward completely onto his own lap and just groans. From that position, just facing the floor, head between his knees, he says, I got such a fucking hangover right now. I also didn't tell Ravane that you're in the city, so it, it cancels out. I don't think that's how any of this works. It's not. And Eleanor just puts both of her hands together, puts them in front of her mouth, and goes, Zed. I'm on my hands and fucking knees, Zed. I'm begging, I'm begging, I'm begging you. Just like a little bit of effort. And Zed, still with his head in between his knees, goes, I'm working real hard on trying to put together what the fuck I was thinking last night, so you, you, give, give me a minute. I'll help you with that later when we have a little more privacy. Go pack your shit, Zed. We're probably leaving the city today. He sits up, dusts his hands off, wincing, and goes, Yeah, that that I can do. Uh, dah. He looks at you, looks at Eleanor, and then stands up and leaves the room. <laughs> Leo waits for him to leave takes another big slug of his coffee, and then sits the mug down, stands up, and fully starts pacing the living room. Eleonora scooches along the couch so she can pick up the sword that you saw propped against it last night, and just starts agitatedly polishing it. Leo continues to pace, but after Zed gets out of the room, he kind of looks over his shoulder at Eleonora as he goes. Uh, Zed and I obviously are going, but I- wouldn't dream of dragging you into this if it's not something you're interested in. I understand that it's been hard for you, too. I'm sorry about your father. I really am. I know we didn't always see eye to eye, but I know how important he was to you. Eleonora lets out this really bitter laugh. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, the two of us weren't getting along as well as we used to by the time it happened. So, besides, uh, his mind had been going for a couple years at that point. It's, he would have wanted to go out before it was bad. Leo stops pacing for a second and processes that. More importantly, processes the implications that it has about his time in Tordoon and what happened there. And winces really hard before spinning around on his heel and going back to pacing again. I understand. It's still not easy, though, and I know firsthand in a couple different situations how hard it is to heal from losing someone you love and how long it takes. So, like I said, at the end of the day, you don't have a dog in this fight. You don't need to start hauling my shit around on top of yours, because I know you, and I know that that's what you're thinking right now. So just... Do yourself and me a favor and put yourself first, okay? Eleonora looks up from the sword in her lap and says, You want to know why I left Tordoon? Yes, I do. Especially given what a monumentally unsafe decision it was with the world burning down around you. After my father died, um, there's a lot of talk about coronations and me sitting on the fucking throne and all this bullshit that when I was a kid I never thought I'd have to deal with. And I was sitting there thinking, this is the country that my mother died for. And I spent years of my life ignoring and covering up what was going on with my father. And after the whole shit show that went down with you, who knows how many people suffered for that. And I was supposed to, what, be in charge, pretend I didn't do any of that, pretend none of it happened? So, I left. She polishes the sword one more time and then picks up a scabbard and slots it in and says, I've done a lot of thinking since the last time we saw each other. And if you're trying to stop this whole shitty situation and actually do some goddamn good for people then I'm in and she stands up dusts herself off slots the scabbard into her belt and says give me 20 minutes to pack my shit Leo spins on his heel again where he's been pacing and pulls her into his arms 
she hugs you back super tight. He's got her in a vice grip. He's got one hand cupped around the back of her head, just holding her to him, and is trying really hard not to cry. He's feeling some incredibly complicated emotions right now. (sighs) Thank you. And he lets her go. Eleonora actually holds on to you for a second after you let her go, and then nods against your shoulder, pats you a couple times on the back very firmly, (laughs) and then just kind of shifts so both hands are on your shoulders and just pushes back. Right, uh, gonna go do that. And then she heads off down the hallway. As soon as he's alone, Leo just collapses on the couch and fully puts his head in his hands. After a minute, Zed comes back in. He's got the look of somebody that dunked his head under a faucet, and he's just, like, pulling his hair back up into a ponytail. He's got his duffel bag over his shoulder, and he says, Ah, right, um, I'm good, I guess, if you are. Leo does not take his head out of his hands. Nobody in this apartment's good, Zed. We just need to be ready to go. I told my sister to stay at the inn where we found you last night, so we're gonna head over there, pick everybody up, and figure out how to get to Volder, I guess. I don't know. Roll insight really quick. 25. Zed winces almost imperceptibly, and then covers it up with a roll of his shoulders. Alright, uh, it'll be good to meet... Your sister, under circumstances where nobody's trying to kill anybody else, I guess. Unless I put my foot in my mouth, because you and Eleanor both seem, uh, ready to snap. I snapped about a year ago, I'm just maintaining now. Oh, by the way, my sister is dating the lady that melted your face back on the mountaintop, so try to be nice to her. No promises, boss. Zed, I want you to say it with me. If you can't say something nice... Then I'm probably gagged. Let's go. Okay, I'm gonna wait for Eleanor to pack her shit and then we're gonna leave. A couple minutes later, Eleanor comes out carrying a very large trunk, nods at the both of you, and says, Gentlemen. And then she heads out the door. Leo watches her go and his expression softens a little bit. He reaches up and pats Zed on the shoulder a little harder than he means to. The gang rides again. Let's go. As we're walking down the street, I'd like to follow up on that promise I made to Fee last night and fire off a sending spell. The message says, Good morning, shit's fucked. Headed back to the inn with some friends of mine. Get everybody together downstairs, we all need to have a talk. Fee, you are awoken from your trance in a bed in this shitty little inn that you got a room in last night. By your brother's voice in your head. Fee groans and buries her face in her pillow for a second. To your left, a weight beside you in the bed shifts, and you are accosted by the sound of the captain snoring directly in your ear. To your right, there is an absence on the mattress that you were not expecting. Sabine was there when you went into your trance. She's not now. Do you open your eyes? Uh, yeah, that's unsettling enough that feeds up. As you open your eyes, you see directly in front of you the very deeply trancing face of the captain who is snoring like a lumberjack and smells like a rum distillery, and hovering behind him, fully dressed for the day, totally ready to go, you see Sabine crouched beside the bed with a cast iron frying pan in one hand and a big wooden spoon in the other leaning down over his head. She sees you wake up and her eyes widen a little bit. Sabine has the message cantrip, so this will work. She points at you and you get a message in your head that says, Look, please don't judge me for this. If we don't give him consequences, he'll never learn. (laughs) And then she immediately starts beating the shit out of this pan with the spoon right next to the captain's ear. The captain shoots out of bed, bolt upright with a yell. All hands on deck, batten down the hatches! Uh, Oh, 
cave is Thunder Woman. And then he sits back down on the edge of the bed, cradling his head in his hands, so, so hungover. Why? Apparently this was a teachable moment. The captain groans pitifully. Uh, what am I meant to learn that I can't drink the way I did when I was 120? Sabine ceases her assault on the frying pan with the spoon, grins widely, and goes, Exactly, sweetie. I'd be more sympathetic, but I'm finally coming to terms with the fact that that snoring is going to be the first thing I hear every day for the foreseeable future. So. Sabine puts the frying pan and the spoon down on the bedside table and just leans in and kisses the captain on the forehead and then leans over him and kisses you on your cheek. Good morning, everybody. Do we have any idea what's going on after Leo swanned out of here last night? Just got a sending from him, actually. Apparently, he's gathered up some more friends and we're heading out soon. Oh, okay. Um, should we get everybody together then? Because Ravain and Erevay and Verity all went back to their apartment. I can go get them and their folks. Uh, that's a good idea. Um, we can start. I can start brainstorming ways to actually get us to Vuldur while we're waiting on everyone. Okay, well, at least we have an immediate plan. I'll go grab Ravain and Co. You get this man downstairs and get him some greasy breakfast food, and I will be back soon. Will do. Be careful. And then he's gonna slide out of bed and just tug the captain with her. He is just complaining incoherently the entire time you two are getting ready and packing your stuff up. But he is much more capable of intelligent conversation after you get him downstairs and get a big plate of hash browns and some eggs into him. He takes a big swig of coffee that you can just tell by smell probably tastes like tar and brings one hand up to his temple and goes, All right, uh, it appears we're going to be headed out. Soon. I. As soon as we can figure out the most expedient way to get to Vuldur, yes. Right. Well, we can't take the entire crew of the Banshee with us, I reckon. I'll, uh, head down to the harbor, pick up Lorelei, and see to my crew, and be back soon-ish. Oh, my head. Fee's gonna pat him on the shoulder and lean over and kiss him on the cheek and say, Good idea, darling. He gives you a look like he knows that you are judging him, but then shakes his head and stands up and walks out the front door of the bar. And you are left alone, just waiting on all your people to get together. What are you doing? I think Fee spends a good couple of minutes just sitting there with her head in her hands. Uh, and then eats breakfast and, I guess, waits. I don't have anything else to do. Not too long after the captain leaves, you see the door of the inn open again. And Leo walks in, looking fucking haunted. The bags under his eyes have bags under them. And he is followed by Zed, who you saw last night. Again, big, heavy set half-orc dude, lots of tattoos, lots of piercings, big dangly gold jewelry hanging out of his tusks, long hair up in a ponytail. And a person you have never seen before. This very strong, but very compact and petite young lady, who appears to be of goblin and human heritage, with the long, frilled ears and bright, luminous yellow eyes, dressed in armor with a sword at her side, they are both hovering very close to Leo. He walks in, sees you, and lets out the most beleaguered sigh. Good morning to you, sunshine, brother dearest. <laughs> Don't speak to me yet. He pivots on his heel and leaves the two friends that he brought with him to walk up to the bar where this extremely tired, grizzled old dwarvish dude is wiping down the bar top. Garçon, a bloody Mary, if you please, and also the biggest table you have, a private room. Is there a private room? Is there anything? And enters into this conversation with the bartender as these other two people are looking at you extremely awkwardly. Hi. And then Fee pushes a plate forward across the table and says, Pancakes? <laughs> 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 
<laughs> oh, this is horrible. Both of them look at each other for a long moment. And then Zed shrugs and comes over and grabs the plate of pancakes and starts chowing down on him. Leo comes back with a very oversized Bloody Mary and waves toward the back of the bar to usher you into whatever private room he has managed to get for all of you. Fee spares herself a moment to ponder how he managed to get a private room in a dive bar, but goes. Oh, it's not fancy. It is not a private salon. It is a storage room. There are crates of moonshine stacked up along the walls. You get the feeling this is maybe like the break room for the employees that work here. There's a long, rough-hewn wooden table and a few chairs set around it. One of which Leo collapses into immediately and chugs like half of his Bloody Mary before slamming it back down on the tabletop. Okay, where's everybody else? Uh, the captain went back to the Banshee to get Lorelai and tell the crew what they're supposed to be doing while we go to Vuldur, and Sabine went back to Erebe and Verity and everybody's apartment to round all of them up. After several more minutes, Sabine kind of barges into this back room that you guys find yourself in, and she has Ravane, who you met yesterday, Erebe, Verity, and a tall, willowy elven woman of the same kind of wood elf heritage as Ravane is with long, coily red hair behind her. They all come in, shut the door, take up positions around the table. It's a really awkward situation. No one's saying anything to anybody. The silence is deafening. And after a few more minutes, the captain shows back up. He's got Lorelai by one shoulder, kind of ushering her in through the door. And you're all cramped in this little back room with crates and provisions stacked around you. Leo plants both hands on the table and stands up very slowly. Okay, so we should all start with introductions, since... Many of us have tried to kill each other in the past, and those of us that haven't done that have no idea what's going on here. I'll start. Hello, my name is Leirel Valsine. I am the Grand Duke of Australia, and I am this close. I am this close to absolutely losing my shit. Fee! I'm Ferrara. I am the slightly less dramatic sibling. Leo flips you off. And then sort of elbows this young lady that you've never met before, and she steps forward. Hi, I'm Eleonora Ashthorn. I'm Leo's ex-girlfriend. Don't worry, we're cool. And then she leans over and elbows Zed in the side, and he flinches and stands up a little straighter. (sighs) Um, I'm Zed Stonebloom. I'm Leo's, uh, I'm here. Leo sort of cuts him off and goes, he's my boyfriend, also don't worry, and he waves back and forth between Zed and Eleonora. They're cool. Anyway, moving on. The rest of you kind of go around in a circle and introduce yourselves each in turn. The last person who says anything is Lorelai. She is standing at the table next to the captain with absolutely rigid posture, staring at Leo and Zed and Eleonora at the other end of the table. Go ahead and roll insight. 17. Lorelai looks extremely hurt and betrayed. She narrows her eyes down toward the other end of the table and goes, Not that anybody cares, but hi, I'm Lorelai Shakrana. I'm Leo's dead fiancé's little sister. And then she storms out of the room. Zed and Eleonora both look extremely uncomfortable, and Leo reaches out after Lorelai as she storms out. Uh, Lorelai! (sighs) But he doesn't follow her. From beside you, Fee, Sabine sort of hisses and goes, I've got her, update me later, and then heads out after her. Fee, uncomfortable, (laughs) says, Right, so travel plans. Once again, the silence in the room is oppressive. (laughs) But eventually, Ravane, looking extremely uncomfortable, raises one finger into the air. Um, I mean, we could always take the train. 
the rail system in Vogvoldur is still functional. We could at least get as far as Derderol that way. Once we get up towards Voldur, it gets a little more complicated. The capital's on an island that's pretty much surrounded by the blockade. But I think at this point, with all of the interconnecting issues that are going on, and he looks over at Leo very sharply, perhaps the best course of action is just to get as close as we can and roll with the punches. That's all any of us are doing anymore, right? Rolling with the punches! Verity reaches out a hand and squeezes his shoulder and goes, Babe, I love you. You're shrooming out a little bit right now. Ravain does have a couple little mushroom caps popping up along his hairline. He looks on the fucking edge. Cool. Awesome. What's the train? A very large mushroom appears on the side of Ravain's temple. A train is those things you've seen zooming around the inside of the caverns. The the big metal things, lots of smoke. Um, there's a rail system that connects all of the major cities in Vogvoldor, except for the capital, which, in terms of, you know, infrastructure design, was a really stupid decision. But either way, it's an overnight train trip up to Derderol, and then we just figure out how to get past the blockade on your part again, I guess? I don't know. Nobody was suggesting any other viable options. I'm just trying to help. It's very helpful. Thank you. Okay, so we all get on the train and figure out how to get into Voldur on the way? Rufain puts both hands up like he is washing his hands of the situation and goes, I don't know, I'm just contributing what I can. And down at the other end of the table, Leo pinches the bridge of his nose and goes, Yeah, we we get on the train, and we make everything else a problem for later. This is becoming a bad habit, but I'm not in a place where I can examine it right now. Same, let's go. You all head out of the train station. Everybody who has lived in Gimtarum for the last year seems to know pretty much where it is. It seems like it is built to be able to handle a lot more hubbub than there currently is at it. It's not deserted. There are still people moving on and off of trains and going about their business. But it seems like it is usually a lot busier than this. The Fecule kind of break away from the pack and go off to talk to the guy at the ticket booth. You see the captain like scrounging in his coat pocket and pull out a bag of coins. And then Fee talks very charmingly to the person selling tickets as Sabine kind of looks over destination maps. The rest of you are left standing kind of awkwardly in the middle of this train platform. I'd like to check on Lorelai. What's she doing? Lorelai is furious. Like, you knew that as you were leaving the bar. She has not calmed down the entire walk. She is not looking at you. She is sneaking furious glares in Zed's direction. And she is just standing there with her arms crossed over her chest. She is extremely angry. And I have learned pretty valuable lessons about how it is not my place to try to mitigate Lorelai's anger. So I'm not going to try to insert myself into that situation. I'm just going to wait for Fee and Sabine and the captain to get back with our tickets. After a few minutes, they all come back over. Fee kind of holds up a handful of tickets and says, So, we have three, I don't know how to translate the dwarvish word, boxes? Boxes. Uh, Leo speaks dwarvish. Compartments? Yeah, that's the one. Uh, we have three of them. Apparently they each sit about four people, so I figured that would be... And she looks around the group at all of the interpersonal tension that is happening. I thought that'd be fine. Uh, it's gonna be an overnight trip. We should get there late tomorrow afternoon. So... I'm gonna go. It should be here in, the guy said, ten minutes? And then she walks off to a little, like, fenced-off sub-platform with a bunch of benches in it. Leo is just going to sit down on the nearest flat surface and put his head in his hands for the umpteenth time today. 
Lorelai storms off and goes and sits next to Faye. As you're sitting there, the captain, sounding very admiring, says, Oh, you're a big son of a bitch, aren't you? You ever stole on a boat, big man? And Zed, standing next to you, says, Oh, God. No. Without lifting his head from his hands, Leo says, Don't! I wasn't doing any- Number one, I'm sitting right here. And number two, he is so spoken for. There is another long, awkward moment of silence. And then the captain says, So trains, huh? Never been on one of those. If Leo had his way, he would never take his head out of his hands again. Yeah, me neither. But, uh, means to an end, I guess. Aye. And I'll take just about any excuse to get out from underground at this point. Hasn't been a good day for me so far. As he's saying that, you hear a long, slow whistle. And then, from far away, Fee yells, All right, everybody, that's us. Another pause. And then the captain says, Ah! Fuck this! I look up, finally. You saw the little steam engines that kind of carry things around Gimtarum. You saw those the first time you were here. This is like that, but a lot bigger. It is basically just a metal tube with steam coming out of a little spout near the front of it. Fee is gesturing towards it as to imply that your group should get on. It's bigger than the ones you've seen before, but it's not big, and it is emerging out of a tunnel in the rock. The captain looks deeply unhappy as your group converges on this train. Yep, I'm not saying anything to anybody. I'm gonna get on. You all pile on. Your tickets have, like, numbers of compartments that you should go to, so you all get settled in. Zed stops as you're going past and just sits down in a bar car. He does not say anything to you. He is not really looking at anybody. He just sits down. But the rest of you carry on. Lorelai is at the front of the pack, just stomping the entire way through the train. Without looking at anybody, she just sits down in the first compartment you get to. Sabine sits next to her. Ravane and Verity pile into a separate compartment. Everybody kind of gets settled. Yeah, I'm just going to go wherever my ticket tells me I should. It's just kind of a little box with a window on the side, not a big one, and two benches that are against the wall facing each other. After a minute, Eleonora comes in, sits on the bench opposite you. Leo just sits there in silence for a really long time, and once the train starts moving, I think jumps pretty profoundly, but then goes back to leaning back at the bench and pinching the bridge of his nose. <sighs> well, I guess it's safe to assume that Zed won't be back for a little bit. Nah, given the uh, past eight months of experience, I wouldn't count on it. Yeah, and, uh, speaking of past experience, you and I didn't exactly leave things on the best terms, did we? <laughs> That's a bit of an understatement, given that where we left things was, you know, my father tried to kill you, you broke up with me, you ran off into the woods. I, I didn't want to, you have to know that I didn't want that I <sighs> I do know that and I also know that what you did want didn't and couldn't include me I wish you wouldn't say it like that I wanted for none of this to ever happen but yeah at the end of the day I think you're right the things we want, and more importantly, the things we have to do, can't include each other in the way that I wanted them to. Just for closure's sake, did you ever actually love me? Oh no, I just fuck up my relationship with the only family member I have left for any Tom, Dick, and Larry that walks into my bedroom. Yes, I loved you, you jackass. I still do. 
but she kind of slumps in her seat and crosses her arms over her chest and says, I think we both know that our plans for the future don't include each other in that way, right? That is something that Leo has known for a while, but hearing it out loud feels like getting punched directly in the chest. He kind of bows forward a little bit where he's sitting on the bench. So what now? We just press forward and go on trying to meet the goals we've set for ourselves and accept that everything we had was what, a pipe dream? A could have been? What's the alternative? We try again, we get a worse ending than the first time, we cheapen what we had, trying to make something that's not going to work limp along. I don't want to do that. Yeah, um, neither do I. So now I guess we get to figure out how to be grateful for what was there and how to build something else moving forward. She kind of reaches up and rubs at one of her eyes and then gives you a big watery smile. On the bright side, we're going up against the despot trying to stop a war between two power-hungry world superpowers, so we might all die tomorrow. Leo lets out something between a laugh and a sob and just pulls her into a big, tight hug. She hugs you back, pats you back a couple times, and then pulls back and says, So, what, are you and me just going to play checkers for the next six hours, or? (laughs) Uh, no, you'd kick my ass and I'm a sore loser. Anyway, I've been putting off a conversation I really need to have with Zed since last night, or, (laughs) well, for the last year, really. So, I'm going to go do that, and tomorrow we'll wake up in Daredoral and figure out where we're going from there. Yeah, I guess so. And then she reaches out and pats you on the shoulder a couple times and says, Good luck with that talk. Leo goes to leave the compartment and pauses in the doorway with his hand clenched around the doorframe. Eleonora? Eleonora has her feet kicked up on the other bench again. She doesn't look towards you as she says, Yeah? I still love you too. And Leo walks off into the corridor and goes to try to find Zed. Fee, you find yourself in this cramped little compartment on the train with Lorelai curled up in one far corner, these bright orange, waxy-looking earplugs jammed into her ears, and the captain curled up in the other, making himself as small as possible, looking at the wall. After a minute, Sabine comes in, drops off her bags, and kind of scoops Lorelai out around her shoulders and ushers her out into the corridor. And you are sitting in this train compartment with these two bench seats facing each other, alone, with the captain. What do you do? Fee looks over at the captain and says, Sweetheart, is there anything I can do? Do you want me to... Open the window? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, window, window sounds good. I'm gonna see if I can open the train window. (laughs) There are blinds that are down across this window, and you lift them up to reveal that you are going through this tunnel under a mountain, and there is nothing outside of this window save for a wall of rock about six inches outside the glass rushing by, and the captain goes, Ah, no, no window. Window's a bad thing. Just go ahead and, yeah, no. If he's gonna close the shutters again. He goes back to staring very intently at the inside wall of the compartment that you're in. After a few more minutes, you hear the door slide open, and Verity comes in with an armful of candy bars, cotton candy, pretzels, various snack food as she bumps the door to the side with her hip and edges her way into your compartment. Hi, everybody! Did you know that there's a really nice lady that comes down the train with a cart full of snacks? I brought some! I didn't know what you'd like. 
Captain, we haven't talked that much, and I feel like you got really mad at me when I analyzed your birth chart, so I brought you some cotton candy. I feel like you'd like that. The captain says nothing to Verity, but does reach up and take the little tub of cotton candy from her hand. I... Thank you, Verity. You seem like a chocolate person, so I got you a couple candy bars you can pick. Her arms are just overflowing with snack foods right now, and she has a variety of about six different kinds of chocolate bar. Where did you get the money for all of- You know what? And if he takes just any chocolate bar that has some kind of caramel or nuts in it. Verity smiles in a very self-satisfied way and then posts up on the opposite bench across from you and the captain and starts digging into a little bag of pretzels. If he's going to sit in silence eating her candy bar for a solid minute and then awkwardly clear her throat and say, <coughs> uh, Verity, there, there is something that I wanted to ask about. And then she stops and she turns to the captain and she says, sweetheart, I've had a thought. Uh, I could really use some coffee if you wanted to find the person that is apparently selling snacks to people or something. I I would really appreciate it. Right, right, a job, something to do. That sounds fan-fucking-tastic. And he jumps up to his feet and charges out of the compartment, very clearly wanting to find a bigger amount of space around him than there is right now. Verity is still sitting across from you, munching on her pretzels and just looking at you expectantly. Fee turns to fully face Verity and then says, I met someone since the last time I saw you that I think was from the Silent City and I wanted to see if you had any more information on this person. Oh, um, well, yeah, I know pretty much everybody from the Silent City. It was the only place I ever went until I met you in Erebe, so lay it on me. Fee grimaces and takes another large bite of her candy bar. A woman, I'd say 50-ish years older than me, uh, tall, green skin, twisting horns, and Fee kind of illustrates the shape, goes by the name of Defiance. Verity was in the process of taking a pretzel out of her bag to put into her mouth and drops it back into the bag. Her eyes go really big. Uh, oh, uh, d- Defiance, yeah, uh, yeah, I know her. What happened? That is a very, very long story uh, uh, that ends with her jumping off a boat. Verity's eyebrows pinch together and she frowns really deeply. Well, um, Defiance, she, um... She is kind of the reason that I was the Apprentice High Priestess when you met me. The succession of who the High Priestess is in the Silent City doesn't go down through families, you understand. It was my mother, but after her it was supposed to be Defiance. Because she was born with talent and the Stormbringer's blessing and all of that stuff that I don't have. Now, Verity, you have a lot going for you. You're very plucky. There's a moment where Verity's grave expression drops and she grins very broadly. Thank you! And then she shifts back into a more serious expression. But anyway, Defiance, she was really powerful, you know? Quite a bit older than me, I was just a kid when she left, but she was training under my mom to be the next High Priestess, and then... Well, she had a big family, see? Mom, dad, brother, couple sisters. They were all rangers, folks that we would send out to help keep all of us fed, and they went out on a fishing trip one day. Defiance was still back in town with my mom doing training stuff, and they never came back? Again, I'm sorry I can't give you more information. I was just a little kid when this happened, but my mom told me that what happened was that Defiance lost her faith. She lashed out against the Stormbringer, and her power changed. 
became different? I don't know. But when she turned 100, she left, just like everybody else in the Silent City is allowed to do when they turn 100. And we never heard from her again. So, I became the Apprentice High Priestess, even though I, you know, um, I wasn't really suited for the job. How did you meet her? What is she doing? Well, no, she's not doing a lot, but I... She was, uh, working for the Asurian Navy, and also running a pirate fleet. Oh, that sounds bad. Yeah, she did try to kill all of us, like, really hard. I just... She had one of NNC kind of gestures with her shield and at the orb in it. One of these, and her magic was weird... Verity fully flattens herself back against this bench seat that she's sitting on, staring at the orb in the middle of your shield. Where did you get that? Oh, right, I forgot you didn't. Uh, fr- from my birth mother. Again, long story. Also, it was a year ago, so I don't really want to rehash it now. Okay, that's fair, but yeah... Again, I was just a little kid, but I remember her having something that looked almost exactly like that. It was what she used to cast her magic. People said it came as a gift directly from the Stormbringer. Yeah, I did see that. Her magic was weird. And she said a lot of fucked up things. And then jumped off of her own boat into shark-infested waters, so she's not really a problem anymore. But... Oh my god, she died?! Verity looks extremely distraught. Again, she tried to kill us, like, really, really tried to kill us, and got a lot of people killed, and she sucked. I get that you're a very sensitive person, but she sucked. Verity looks extremely shaken as she reaches down into the bag next to her and slowly chomps on another pretzel. Oh, um, well, that's... Is that sad? I... No, because she sucked. I don't... Okay, anyway, that's all I can tell you. I don't know much more about her. It's fine. I... I don't even know why I asked. I just feel like something's unfinished in all of this. I, I don't know. I feel like I'm missing something. Well, I mean, you have an orb like hers, so... Maybe that's another gift that the Stormbringer gave you, right? Maybe she knows what's coming next. That's fair. It's been a few weeks since I've talked to her. I might have to ask some questions. You've talked to her? It's a long, long story. We can have this discussion later. Verity, looking extremely shaken, gathers up all of her snacks and nods at you slowly. Okay, that was ominous. I'm gonna go find Ravane. So true. I'm glad you two are happy. We're so happy. He's so nice to me. He tells me I'm pretty all the time. It's great. And she leaves the compartment and kicks the door shut behind her. So, Leo. Last we saw you, you were heading off to find Zed. You find him in the bar car, sitting at the bar, you catch him actually in the middle of just slamming a shot with two empty shot glasses already on the bar top next to him. As you walk in, he gestures to the bartender for another one, like a guy who is drowning. With very similar mannerisms, Leo is going to settle onto a bar stool next to him and wave for one of whatever he's getting. You two sit there in silence for a second. Zed is not looking at you. He is looking down at the bar top, chipping at the varnish on the wood with one of his fingernails. Leo takes his shot and then is also not looking over at Zed. He's also staring down at the bar top. So we're going to need to talk. I won't make you do it now if you don't want to. You can wait until. Whenever you're ready. But we're gonna need to talk. (laughs) 
He laughs humorlessly, slams a shot, wipes his mouth with the back of his hand, and says, Boss, if you're gonna chew me out, I'd rather you just get it fucking over with. That's not... <sighs> Look, I'm sorry if I was pissy with you earlier. I'm not here to rip you a new one and make you feel worse about the situation than I'm sure you already do. But we need to talk, Zed. So much of everything about this shit that has gone wrong has gone wrong because we haven't talked. Oh, that's why shit went bad, huh? Because we didn't talk? He puts a hand up and then gestures the bartender again, and then turns back to you and says, You want to talk? Sure, let's talk. Let's talk about how I thought you fucking died in front of me. Let's talk about how I had you, and then I fucking didn't, and you were gone, and I thought it was because I wasn't fast enough. So, yeah, I went down the fucking mountain and I got drunk. And then, when that didn't fill up the fucking hole in my stomach, I went out and I got high. Because that's what I do when I feel like shit. Alright. A couple hours pass, I'm coming to terms with the fact that I fucked three years of progress. And then the first thing I hear from you, since I thought you died, is don't wait up, Zed. I might not be back, Zed. So sure, let's fucking talk, Leo. Let's talk our way through that. And then he slams the shot glass that the bartender puts in front of him. Leo also waves for another shot and slams it. What do you want? You want an excuse? You want a justification? I can't give it to you. I can try to explain what happened, but honestly, I don't think you care about that. I want to talk. Not so I can explain away all the shitty things that I did, or so you can justify all the shitty things that you did. I just want to talk, Zed. Can you give me that? Zed flinches when you say that. He stops, rolls his shoulders back, reaches up to, like, scratch at the inside of his arm, and then back to rub at his neck, and says, ah, Yeah, yeah, I can- Yeah, sorry, I- Let's talk, can we, can we go somewhere else? Yeah, I- yeah, come on. Leo is not taking him back to their compartment because Eleonora, as far as he knows, is still in there. I'm gonna try to find somewhere that we could talk privately. I don't know what I'll have to roll for that. That'd be a survival check, buddy. Fifteen? I think if you walk through the train long enough, you find, like, baggage storage. A car that is just a bunch of people's luggage. Yeah, I pull Zed in there and shut the door behind us. Zed says nothing on the way there. You usher him into this car and he just stands there, arms crossed over his chest, like hunched in on himself. Leo turns around from where he has shut the door behind them and just fists his hands up in his hair. I don't want an explanation. I just... I just want to know where we are right now. There's a long moment of silence, and then he says, What happened last night? I mean, I know the company safe version you gave Eleonora, but I don't- I- <sighs> What the fuck happened? I helped shut the fight that you were in the middle of down- took you outside you tried to kiss me and I really wanted you to and we did and then I started freaking out and then realized what was happening so I stomped that shit down I got you home you tried to kiss me again I shut it down probably in a meaner way than I should have and it wasn't that I didn't want 
we keep coming back here, you know? And I just... Even though I know I probably already am, I don't want to be something you regret. And I get that you never asked for any of this, or for me, but it's what happened, and I'm here, and I... I guess I just need help understanding why every time I feel like I get close to you, you push me away. He rakes a hand through his hair and just laughs humorlessly and goes, <laughs> I, I guess I'm just a piece of shit, man. It's easy to love me while I'm in front of you, and then the second I'm out of sight, it's just... <laughs> <laughs> he just puts his head in his hands and I think sits down on the nearest like trunk or box or something you know he said that to me once my ex I mean we'd been together for like uh, fuck almost a year at that point and I left him not for long. I went to all of our friends, and they were all his friends, obviously. And because they were all his friends, they all told me I was overreacting and I had to go make it right. So I went home after a day, and I begged him to take me back. And he said, You know what, Zed? You're so easy to love when you're in front of me. But when you go, I just remember all the things I love you in spite of. <laughs> and he puts his head back in his hands. <laughs> you know, I slept on the front porch that night. Fucking freezing out. And I just... <sighs> Cause shit, he was probably right. And I hadn't talked to anybody that gave a shit about me in months. I'd given them all that time to remember all the fucked up things about me. He looks up from his hands and he just reaches back and fists both of them in his hair. <laughs> Did you have enough time to remember all the fucked up shit about me? Leo gets down on Zed's level and gets his face in both hands and presses their foreheads together. That is not what this is. Listen, before I met you, I had people that told me I wasn't worth shit and could never be good, could never be anything. Or people that told me I was perfect and didn't need to change. And then I met you. And you told me something different. And I get that things at the beginning were complicated and then I got zapped all the way across the world and we didn't have the chance to really talk it through, but I... <sighs> you are better than this. We are better than this. And the only reason I know that is because of you. I almost died several times trying to get back here. And I honestly believe, at a couple points there, I could have made the choice to die, and the man I was five years ago would have done it. Would have said that the world that never gave a shit about him could fucking burn. But I got up. And I lived. And that is because of you. You have changed me. Knowing you has changed me. Loving you has changed me. And I don't love you in spite of anything. I love who you are. But more than that, I love who you could be. You deserve to be better than you are now. Fuck, I deserve to be better than I am now, and it took you to make me realize that. 
So don't worry about whether or not I had enough time to remember all the fucked up shit about you. I did. I do. But the thing is, I have spent long enough wrestling with my own demons, Zed. I am not afraid of going a couple rounds with yours. Zed lets out. It's more a noise than a sob. Just... <laughs> and claps a hand over his mouth and just bows forward. Leo just squeezes both of his hands a little bit tighter where they're clasped on either side of Zed's face and leans in, kisses him on the forehead. Okay, rest. We need to rest. Come on, let's go. Let's just go lay down. And he's going to try to get him back up and get him back to the compartment. Fee, the rest of your day is pretty uneventful. You do not see Leo from the moment you get on the train. He's just gone. Most of your time on this journey is spent in the compartment with the captain as pretty much your only constant companion. Sabine and Lorelai are in and out throughout the day. The hours wear on, all of you end up going to the dining car later and sitting down for dinner, coming back to the compartment. These bench seats fold out into beds, and there are pull-down bunks that come out of the wall, and you all set yourself up to take your trance. You are woken up pretty suddenly by a whoosh of air outside the train, and a bright, sudden light coming in from the blinds pulled down over the window in your compartment. Okay, uh, I'm gonna pull the blinds up, see what's going on. From one of the pull-down bunks over your head, as you lift up the blinds over this window, you hear the captain go, Oh, thank fuck! Because you have lifted up the blinds to a gorgeous mountain view as the train exits the subterranean tunnels that it has been traveling through throughout the night. The captain lunges out of bed, shoulders past you, throws up the window, and hangs his head out like a dog out of a car, <laughs> just taking very deep breaths and looking extremely relieved. He's gonna grab the back of his shirt so he doesn't fall out the window. The captain is just whooping in joy and utter relief, which wakes Sabine up in the other bench seat that has been folded down into a bed. She sits up with a mumble, kind of squints around at everything that's going on. <sighs> All right, guess we're most of the way there, then. Good morning, everybody. And your day goes on from there. You all get up, get out of bed, get Lorelai ready for the day, go to the dining car, get breakfast. Everybody except Leo and Zed is there. The train keeps winding through these narrow mountain passes for several more hours. It's mid-afternoon. I think most of you are hanging out in the dining car right after lunch. Again, no sign of Leo and Zed. When you hear a rattle as Ravane leans over to a window and lifts up the curtains and goes, Oh shit, there it is. I look out the window. The city of Derderal is absolutely nothing like Gimtarum. Any preconception of a Vulduran metropolis that you might have had in your head after being in and around Gimtarum for the time that you were is totally demolished. It is this massive, sprawling city nestled in the valley between three snow capped mountain peaks leading out into a harbor that is easily five times the size of Gimtarum's, and a churning, gray, stormy sea beyond. It's beautiful in this late afternoon sunlight, smoke rising from chimneys down in the valley, other trains shooting down along tracks from the other mountain peaks. But it seems subdued much in the way that Gimtarum was when you left it. 
As the train winds down out of this mountain pass, you get a better look at this massive harbor and what lies beyond it. Namely, the sails and flags of many, many Australian naval vessels hovering just beyond the borders of the harbor. Surrounding something very interesting. As the train winds its way down into the city of Deirdreal and you get a better look at what is lying out beyond the horizon, you see a mountain out in the water, sloping ridges going up very gradually. And from the top of this mountain, you see a swirling column of smoke rising up into the air. As you're standing there looking out the window, Erefe draws up next to you, kind of fiddles with her duffel bag that she's got slung over her shoulder and adjusts her goggles over her eyes. So, um, that's Vulder. Well, that's not Vulder. Vulder's inside the mountain, so you understand how difficult it's going to be to get over there, right? Well, we got through one blockade. I'm sure we can manage. I mean, well, not to be a pessimist. Uh, Actually, yes, to be a pessimist. I feel like being a pessimist is kind of my role in all of this, now that I think about it. You got through the blockade on an Australian ship with a good bit of luck. We don't have the ship anymore, and can we ride on whatever's left of that luck? The way I see it, we're going to need a fair bit of luck either way. It, we'll, we'll come up with a plan. We'll, um, if he's going to look around for a second and go, Sabine, if you can think of ideas, that'd be great. Has anyone seen my brother? Sabine looks supremely uncomfortable and sort of shifts back and forth on her feet a little bit. Um, no, can't say I have, but as far as plans go, we'll need to get across the bay to make it into the city. We know that Fen and Kalesa and Mia are all inside that mountain, so that's where we need to go. It's just going to be getting across the big stormy bay full of very well-armed Australian naval vessels that's kind of a little hiccup in the situation. Can I estimate how much space we'll need to cover over the water? Just looking at it. Uh, you're on a very fast moving train winding down into a big urban setting. Go ahead and roll me perception. That's a natural 17, so a dirty 20. Fee, you grew up in a seaside town. You're pretty experienced with eyeballing nautical distances, especially from the shore. You would say it's somewhere between a mile and two miles from the farthest point of this bay over to the closest point of the island where Valder is. It would be an easy trip if there weren't a bunch of Australian ships armed to the teeth with cannons and battle mages sitting out there between you and your destination. Yeah, and as far as I know, the only ones of us that have any kind of teleportation magic are me, Sabine, Lorelei, and Leo's friend, Talindra, and none of us, I don't think, have the spell slots to get us over there, magically. Not even one of you, much less all of you, with the magic that you saw on the mountaintop and your experience with learning about Sabine's magic, she couldn't even get herself all the way over there, much less 11 people, which is what you're dealing with right now. As you are coming to that realization, the door to the dining car swings open with a clatter, and Leo walks in, still in his clothes from yesterday, looking extremely tired, extremely sad, extremely fragile. He just walks down the length of the dining car without saying anything to anyone else and collapses into a booth next to Eleonora and grabs for some snacks left over from lunch. Fee grimaces and says, 
I hate to pile shit on when you're already down, but... And she nods at the window. We need to figure out a way to get over there. I was thinking if any of us have any way to keep hidden, we could see if we could find like a rowboat or something. I, I, I don't I don't know. Oh, I could keep us hidden, no problem. From down at the other end of the dining cart, Verity, who has been canoodling with Ravane <laughs> over afternoon tea, raises one hand. I got a spell for that, don't worry. Uh you all just have to stay close to me. It's the same thing that I did when we were getting off the boat in Gimtarum, you remember? Right. Yes, 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 yes. That would be helpful. It's just a matter of uh, figuring out how to get a boat without everything going terribly. Leo, again, looking exhausted, runs a hand back through his hair. Um, Verity, how long do you have on that spell? Because I, I might have something. Verity launches up from where she's been sitting with Ravain and goes and leans over the table at him a little close into his personal space. Oh, I think the longest I can make it last is like an hour. Is that going to be okay? Will that help? That will help just so much. You can go sit back down now. And Verity trots back down the dining car and sits back down next to Ravain. You see Leo reach down to his belt and pull out this beat-up old leather journal, almost, looking book, and start flipping back through it. Right. Uh, okay, if we've got the beginnings of a plan, how about everyone go gather up your stuff and get ready to disembark? If he's gonna nod at the captain and raise her eyebrows as like a motion of, can you get my shit? <laughs> and then sit next to Leo. The captain nods briskly and makes his way out of the dining car. Everybody files out pretty quickly after that. And you are left alone in this dining car with your brother, who, as soon as everybody else leaves, fully collapses down and rests his head on the table. Do you want to talk, or is this more a stuff some of the train company's dishware in our bags and go somewhere where we can throw it against a wall conversation? Don't tempt me, V. We're both too broke to go breaking the rail company's property, and only one of us is cute enough to be able to convince the captain to front us the cash to pay off any collateral damage. Yeah, but don't beat yourself up about that. He's got high standards, and I'm just exceptionally adorable. And then she's gonna elbow him in the side. Talk. About what? Oh, oh, oh the, the travel plants, the, yeah, getting to the island, the thing that we're here for. Yep, mm-hmm. No, not about that. More about whatever's making you say about what in the tone of somebody about to be hit with a guiding bolt. No, I, I, I didn't. I'm not. I'm fine. I'm good. I'm... <sighs> Are you out of adjectives? Can I suggest full of shit? Go fuck yourself. He fully puts his head in his hands and just braces his elbows on the table. Zed's not doing great. And no small part of that is because of me. So I'm just trying to figure out how to cope with that and don't really have time to because we need to figure out how to get all of us across this bay and into this mountain to stop the war that is threatening thousands of people's lives. And that's what we need to be worrying about because my life doesn't matter. None of my shit matters. Okay. I can do something, but you're not gonna like it. Uh, uh, okay. What? He still got this beat-up leather-bound book open on the table in front of him, and he leafs back through a couple pages to where there is scratchy writing in Priest's tongue that you know for a fact is not Leo's handwriting. You've seen enough of his handwriting to know that it's not his. He points to it, and you see that it is a spell called Water Walk. Leo frowns and tilts his head a little bit. 
I can cast this spell. And what's more, I can cast it in a way that will let me preserve my power in case we get over there and I need to drop some big bad magic to keep us all safe. It's just going to take me about 10 minutes to do the spell. The problem is that I can only cast it on 10 people. You, Sabine, the Captain, Lorelei, Ravane, Eleonora, Celica, and Talindra, but it's one body, Erevé, Verity, and Zed. That's 10. And me makes 11. I can get 10 people a couple of miles across that bay, and Verity can hide them. But I can't get 11. I can send you all over there, and Verity can keep you safe, and I can follow and come later. But I can't come with you. Well, that's not acceptable. You'll get yourself caught trying to go past the blockade if Verity's not with you. Fee, we don't even know what we're gonna do once we get into the city. You've got the better shot out of the two of us of making something happen. At least Astraria still loves you. I... No. No. This is crazy. Uh, someone else has to be able to hide people. Uh, isn't... Isn't one of your friends a druid? Can't we... Relying on Talindra to be willing to be separated from Ravain when the stakes are this high is a losing bet, just trust me. Then he comes over with you too. He can't. He won't. I know him well enough to know that he's not gonna leave Verity and you need her to keep you safe. Either way, you're not throwing yourself on the sword just because you've had a shitty week, Leo. I don't accept it. We're not doing it. We're gonna figure something else out. He plants both hands on the table and gets very suddenly to his feet. And what if I need to? What if throwing myself on the sword is easier than dealing with the absolute shit show that I've created? Fee gets up too. She gets up in his face and just hisses. I don't give a shit what's easier. We're figuring this out. And I'm not letting you do this. That's the end of it. So either we figure out a way to execute your plan that doesn't get my fucking brother killed, or we figure out a different plan. That's final. Leo makes a supremely frustrated noise and shoulders past you and storms out of the dining car. Fee yells, I love you too, you asshole, after him. And Leo, what are you doing? I'm going to go try to find Zed and tell him that we're getting ready to go. Zed is back in your train compartment where you left him, sitting on one of the pull-out beds, just with his head in his hands. Leo's going to sit down next to him and also put his head in his hands. As you sit down next to him, he does sit up and like roll his shoulders back and just plaster on a smile. So, uh, what's the plan, boss? Uh, roll me insight really quick. 26. Disregarding any of the emotional issues, because we did already hash that out, Zed looks physically extremely uncomfortable. He looks like he is having a bad time. As you're sitting there, he, like, rolls his shoulders again, cracks his neck, scratches at the inside of his arm. He's very fidgety. Leo's gonna reach out and grab his hand. Um, train's slowing down. We're getting ready to hit Dare to Roll. Um, I've got a plan. It's not a good plan, but it's a me plan. And, uh, we're headed for Volder. So, pack up. Let's get ready to go. I want to get this next part over with as soon as possible. Uh, yeah. 
And he, like, scrubs his hands over his face. Yeah, me too. Let's, yeah. And he reaches down, fishes his duffel bag out from under the bed, slings it over his shoulder, and stands up. Okay, I'm gonna pack my stuff up, too. Get ready to go. The train stops. Your party congregates on the platform. And what are you doing next? Trying to navigate us to the farthest point of land. I'm trying to find the least amount of distance over water that we're going to have to cross. Roll me a low DC survival check. 17. There are city maps pretty much everywhere. They are like plastered to the sides of buildings. You get the impression that Daredoral is a big town to visit. It seems like it did have a thriving tourism industry before, you know, everything. Oh, big sprawling city in the mountains. Big tourism industry. We're in LA. We're in Los Angeles right now. Yeah, pretty much. There are freeways all over the fucking place. You can buy a map at the train station. It's not hard to get to the furthest point out of land. There is this, like, snaking peninsula with a long island that's slightly disconnected from it. There's a big bridge. It seems like this is a popular, like, walking trail because it's right on the water. It's real nice. It's very scenic. There's, like, stupid kitschy gift shops and shit. Okay. I am gathering everybody up on the beach as close as we can get to the island as the crow flies and turning around to look at Fee. All right, so, uh, plans or lack thereof aside, we still need to figure out what we're doing once we get over there. I don't want us running in blind. We can't just waltz into the city and walk into the Australian embassy. That sounds like a good way for me to get killed and you to get kidnapped. Right, but, I mean, I don't know how far ahead we can really plan this. I think we just have to get over there and try to find... An, an inn or something, I... Yeah, but the thing is, I don't know how safe an inn in Valdur would be to a group that has as many Australians in it as we do. Leo, roll me an advantaged history check. Uh, 15? You remember, actually, that you have an aunt and uncle that moved to Vogue Valdur to, quote-unquote, improve relations when you were a kid that, as far as you know, do live in Boulder. Leo squints as he looks out towards this mountain in the distance and then turns back to Fee again. All right, this is going to sound wild, but I think I might have a safer option than an inn. We have family in Boulder. First of all, come again. Second of all, how is any member of our family any safer than an inn at this point? Well, because that family member is our Aunt Nora, uh, you wouldn't know her. She moved to Valder with her husband and their kids way back before you came to court. They wouldn't know you. They And he winces a little bit. They don't even know Leo. But the one incident that sticks out in my mind is that they moved very shortly after the whole family came up to Valentall for a gala, and she gave the old man a noogie in front of the entire Council of Advisors. And besides, we now know that our father is a fratricidal maniac who killed his eldest brother, and I think that presenting this information to our Aunt Nora might endear her to our cause a little bit. Ah, uh, I don't feel like that's a safe enough bet. We don't know this woman. It's not a safe bet, but it might be our best one. I- uh, gah, Just give me a minute, let me check it out. I'm gonna pull out my augury bones. Oh good, that always ends really well. Leo shakes his bones in his hands and asks, How is it going to go if we look for help with our Aunt Nora? I swear to God, if you say wheel and woe again, and then casts them on the beach. The first bone comes up wheel, and then the second one rolls a couple times, and rolls and rolls, and then settles on woe. 
Leo picks up his augury bones and throws them into the ocean. (laughs) I will never cast this spell again. Completely unhinged, Leo stands back up from throwing these bones into the water and goes, All right, fuck this! He grabs a piece of driftwood off the beach and starts drawing a summoning circle in the sand. The spell I am casting, I am casting as a ritual so I don't burn my only 5th level spell slot. But Leo finishes up drawing this circle in the sand, pulls out his knife, makes a shallow cut across his palm, and drips a couple drops of blood down onto it, and casts Commune as a ritual. So I contact my deity and ask up to three questions that could be answered with a yes or a no. Okay. <laughs> Every other time that Camel the Lord of Bones has appeared to you, it has been a very subtle kind of thing where he just appears, usually behind you, and then it's very dramatic as you turn to look at him. You cast the commune spell. There is a loud popping noise. <laughs> And then Kimrel appears, one hand outstretched as if he was grabbing something, wearing a fuzzy bathrobe. <laughs> <laughs> and then he stops, his great, majestic horned head tilting in confusion. And he sees you and he goes, <laughs> and clutches the robe tighter around himself <laughs> with both hands. <laughs> He has adopted the posture of a cartoon mom who has just seen a mouse in her pristine kitchen. Everyone behind you except Zed and Eleonora screams very loudly. And then there is a moment of silence as you all regard each other. Kimrel, the Lord of Bones, says, Oh my me! You could warn a guy! You know what? No, I brought you here to ask a question, but... Because you are saying that as someone who has consistently almost always popped in on me, either naked, post-coital, or both, for the last five years, I'm going to point out the hypocrisy there. From behind you, Eleonora says, Yeah, I also take issue with that. As you should. And Leo turns back to Kimrel. Alright, I get three questions, so let's make this short and sweet, because I'm going to be honest here, I really hate talking to you. Fine by me. I was in the middle of watching my stories. What stories were you watching? I have a life outside of you, Lyra. Somehow that hurts a little bit. Anyway, I get three questions. Question number one. You have to tell me the truth. Did my father kill his brother? He gives you kind of a weird look, and then he says, Yes! Question number two. If I tell my aunt this, will she help us? Yes. Question number three. I I don't have a question number three. Hold on. Fee steps out from behind you looking at camera roll and says, Are you and Kiva connected? Kimrel's great horned head, like a cobra focusing on its prey, swivels to look at her, and his purpled silver eyes glimmer. And he says, Yes! And then he disappears. Well, given all of that information, Leo stands there blinking for a couple seconds. Sorry everyone had to see that. That was, my god, um... And then he looks back over at Fee. Told you he was fucking annoying. I don't like him. For multiple reasons now. Oh, same. But yes, going to Aunt Nora seems to be our safest bet with the information we've been given. So here's what's going to happen next. I can get everybody but me across that water with a spell. And I will follow later. Several people start protesting. I don't want to dump a bunch of my power into casting the spell quickly to get us all across the water at the same time. We don't know what's on that island. We don't know what's waiting for us. 
I can send you, and then it'll take me ten more minutes. I'll be right behind you. I'm very good at hiding. The captain taught me well. Everybody is still, like, yelling over you. And then, after a second, Zed, in the middle of the pack, kind of raises his hand and goes, Uh, I mean, if we're just trying to go across the water... And then he elbows past people to get to the shore. You watch him, like, shift his stance, roll his shoulders, and say, This is gonna be... weird. And then he starts running across the water. I do not have the words to describe the motions he is doing. But, like, he is moving on the surface of the water. And then he gets about 20 feet out, turns, kicks up a huge wave as he spins, and then runs back to shore and skids to a stop on the pebble beach next to you. So that's just a thing that Zed can do because of his improved unarmed movement, I believe. He can just do that. Everybody blinks at him for a second as he... Readjusts his stance, cracks his neck, looks at everybody and grins and goes, What? None of your moms thought you had to do that? Fee, where she is standing next to you, stops, turns to look at you, and says, That's ten. Yeah, it is. Alright, everybody group up, give me ten minutes. And I cast Water Walk on everybody but Zed as a ritual. As you're getting to the end of it, Verity casts Pass Without a Trace. You watch this slow shimmer of silvery blue light spread out from around her. Everybody starts to step off the beach. They're all hovering above the surface of the ocean on this water walk spell, except Zed, who's doing some weird shit. He's still staying close enough to Verity that he's protected by the Pass Without a Trace, right? Yeah, he's basically having to run circles around her because he's so much faster than everybody else, but he's staying close. Leo's going to stay behind on the beach and make sure everybody else gets out ahead of him. Everybody starts to step off. Verity, Zed, Lorelai, Talindra, Ravane, Erave, the Captain, Sabine, Eleonora. And Fee stays on the beach with you. She takes one step off, so she has one foot hovering above the surface of the water and one on the pebbles with you. And she holds out a hand. Leo truly realizing for the first time that he is not alone takes that hand and walks out onto the water with her okay so we're gonna roll a big huge group self check we've assigned everyone a die in our little box so we can keep track of them Eleonora rolls with disadvantage because heavy armor the DC is 25, and we have plus 10 because of Pass Without a Trace, so we need to roll an average of 15. Okay, uh, the captain rolled in that 20, so he gets a 35. Leo and Arave each rolled a 37. Good for them. Eleonora, even with disadvantage, got a 23, and so did Verity. Ravane and Sabine both rolled 21s. Fee rolled a 31. Zed rolled a 25. Talindra rolled a fucking 36. Uh, and Lorelai got a 33. Okay, that's an average of 28.9, so 29. So that handily beats the DC on the stealth check. You all step onto the beach on the island of Vulder. Fee nods to herself and she says, Okay, we can do this. And then she motions all of you forward, takes a couple steps, 
and I'm going to need everybody to roll a dex save. Okay, well, Leo rolled a 17. The save was a DC 18, bud. You step forward, and around your feet, arcane runes start to glow, and you are ensconced in a resilient sphere. So I'm going to roll deck saves for everybody else in the party. Uh, <laughs> uh, Lorelai, because she just took another barbarian level, rolls with advantage. She got a 24, so Lorelai is out. Erevé rolled a 24 just on her own fucking merit. She is also out. Sabine rolled a 26. Talindra rolled a 21. They are all out. Ravane rolled a 7, but <laughs> seeing this resilient sphere pop up around you, he's going to cast Counterspell at 5th level. So he is out. The captain rolled a 14. Zed rolled a natural 1, so it's a 6. Fee rolled a 7. Eleonora also rolled a natural one, so it's a three, and Verity rolled a twelve. They are all ensconced in resilience spheres with you. Okay, so the only people out are Erebe, Sabine, Talindra, Lorelai, and Ravane, yes? Yep. Sabine gets one action as she sees all of these resilient spheres pop up. She is going to grab Lorelai, cast greater invisibility, and say, run. Find Kalesa. Lorelai goes invisible. And she casts Dimension Door. You see the lights of it flare up in a doorway about her size. And then disappear and another one flares up 500 feet away. As what you recognize as Australian soldiers start to coalesce on you. Dozens of them all holding crossbows trained on all of you. Talindra, with her one action, grabs Ravane. He yells, No! And reaches for Verity, and Talindra does not listen. She pops them both away with her teleportation ability 30 feet outside of the Circle of Archers. Erevé is the only one left with an action. She looks around at all of you, grimaces, and I'm gonna roll dex to see if she can get past these archers. So Erebe is going to roll acrobatics really quick. She rolled a 5. She gets plus 13. It was a DC 20. Erebe does not make it. She gets stopped by this line of archers. She and Sabine are the only ones left out of the bubbles within this circle. As these archers all gather on you, Sabine goes down to her knees, puts her hands up. Erevé gets body blocked by these soldiers, stumbles back and starts reaching for the bow on her back, looking around wildly. The rest of you are all in resilient spheres. You see another dimension door pop up on the mountain. Talindra and Ravane dash forward against Ravane's wishes. Clearly, he is still trying to go back for Verity. And Talindra teleports them again. They are getting as far away as possible, as fast as possible. As the rest of you are ambushed by dozens of Asherian soldiers. Leo, from within the resilient sphere that he's trapped in, puts his hands up over his head, looks over at Fee, and says, Shit. And that's where we're gonna end this week. Everything is bad all of the time. We'll see how our heroes get out of this situation. <laughs> Next time on Compelled Duel. Hey everybody, Barry here with the Postscript, just clearing up a couple housekeeping things here at the end of the episode. As always, we're going to go ahead and plug our social medias. You can find us on Twitter, Tumblr, and TikTok at Compelled Duel. 
We also have a lot of other cool stuff, like an official Spotify profile, an official website. You can find all of that linked on all of our social media pages. We do a weekly Q&A stream on our YouTube channel where we talk about the most recent episode and answer your questions. We would love to see you guys show up for that. If you subscribe to us on YouTube, you'll never miss a notification for those Q&A streams. If you're interested in supporting the podcast, you can find us over on Patreon at patreon.com slash compelled duel, where starting at just $2 a month, you can get all kinds of cool perks, including early access to episodes, access to exclusive playlists and bonus content, even wax sealed letters from your favorite character every month. If you'd like to support us in ways that don't involve pledging to the Patreon, if you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts, we ask that you drop us a rating and a review because that helps the show get promoted to a wider listener base and helps us grow our audience. And as always, word of mouth advertising is the most powerful thing we have going for us right now. So if you like the show, just tell a couple friends about it. And if they like it, ask them to tell a couple friends as well. Episode 20 will be releasing on Friday, October 22nd, 2021, or if you are a member of our Patreon, you'll be getting your early access on Thursday, October 21st. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see y'all next week.